Romans chapter 8, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 12 through 15. We'll pray and then we'll continue on with our extension studies of led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, verses 12, verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can gather together as saints. Uh, what a precious thing to be able to be with like-minded believers, uh, be with uh, believers of, of mutual faith. And uh, if we don't have that, uh, we are able to participate in um, that process and that operation you have by learning your things, by learning the things in which you've set forth in this most precious book, what we call the Bible. And truly they are, and in truth they are your words. They're inspired by you, they're preserved by you, and therefore we can have them in our English language, and therefore we can learn not only what they teach, but what they teach is you. They teach us who you are. And not only who you are, but what you did in time past, what, you do, what you're doing now, and what you'll do in the ages to come. Not to mention uh, what, we'll, what we will participate in for all eternity. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you that we can take this time and redeem it to your honor and glory. There's a lot of things we can do that don't redeem the time, uh, but this is not one of them. And so may we walk consistent with that here now in the second session by not just coming to fill a seat, not just coming to have these things slip through one ear and out the other, uh, but rather, rather honestly attend to these matters, knowing who they come from, knowing uh, what we're looking at isn't uh, just coming from my mouth, but rather we're looking at your words. And there is much significance and importance and gravity to that. So Father, we thank you for this privileged time that we have here this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, again, we are looking at here verse 14, and we are looking at one essentially one main specific thing, and that's this expression that Paul uses in regards to being led by the Spirit of God. Uh, this isn't a verse that is further explaining the previous verses, and the previous verse sets forth the issue of that uh, through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body. And again, as I've stated over and over, uh, and by way of review, if we do anything through the Spirit, it's because we are first led by the Spirit. If we're going to walk after the Spirit, it's because we're led by the Spirit of God. But we need to come to know what that means. And not just in a general manner, but a detailed, specific, uh, in, in, in one sense, a very uh, intelligent, understanding manner. Uh, we cannot afford to mess this up. We cannot afford to not understand what it means to be led by the Spirit of God because it is the Spirit uh, that, that we are walking after. And if we mess up His uh, his activity, if we mess up what this means to be led by the Spirit, well, we mess up our walk. That's just the truth of the matter. And so we need to, uh, I need to, take our time with this information and, and go through it. And, and your side, your responsibility is to understand it, come to understand it, deal with it, not only here, but also at home, throughout your week, mull over it, meditate upon it. And if it's still not clicking, I'm one phone call away. If I don't answer, leave me a voicemail. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And, um, and or email me. Uh, there's a lot of different ways in which uh, you can come to your understanding uh, and that we provide for here at Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. That's our goal. Uh, our heart's desire is for all of you to be edified, to come to the knowledge of the truth, to know God, not only what he was doing in time past, what he's doing now, what he'll be doing yet in the future, and know him most importantly through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're looking at. So this is a very important section of information. Now again, what we've already covered is we looked at this expression by dealing with the, the previous content in Romans. And we saw that what was taking place in the information, there was an education going on. That was further validated by us going in uh, later on in Paul's epistles and see that that takes place. That Paul teaches us, um, that God teaches us, the Spirit is teaching us, um, and those, those were uh, expressions and words that were used in, in, in Paul's later epistles that further validate what we're looking at here. 
And then what we've done is we brought in our study in regards to this matter of looking at two issues in the, what, the Old Testament, his name and the covenants of promise. And we looked at his name was the thing in which God educated his people in. And we saw his name isn't just God, it's not just Jehovah, but it's the issue of, of what makes up who God is. And, and his name identifies all those things. And that is that he's long-suffering, he's abundant in goodness and truth, he's merciful, he's gracious, uh, he does not clear the guilty, uh, therefore he is just, uh, and he has a perfect balance of all those things. That's, that's who he is. Uh, and we saw that Israel had the privilege of manifesting and declaring his name to not only their own people, but to the nations as well, as they were to function as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. They failed to do that miserably. There were certain individuals, th individuals throughout Israel that were able to do that. Um, however, the, the nation as a whole failed to do that. And it wasn't until the Lord Jesus Christ, during his earthly ministry, when he comes in the name of the Lord, he begins to educate Israel about God's name, about who he is, to his people, and not only just for the sake of them knowing him, but that they could reflect him, that they can know him so much that they become like him in their thinking, in their conduct and behavior, and not only influence others, but influence the whole entire world, and fulfill what we are now looking at in regards to the covenants of promise. Now, that's a lot. Uh, that, was, that was about four minutes of a view that took, I think, maybe five, six hours uh, to go through. And so right now, we're dealing with the covenants of promise. All right? Um, and those covenants of promise, again, there's covenants, and then there's covenants of promise. The covenants of promise are unconditional and are provided for by God's grace. The covenants of promise are God's promises made to Israel for the purpose of them participating with him in reconciling the earth. The covenants of promise manifest God's name and therefore his character in essence. The covenants of promise are the means by which he will sanctify and glorify his name. And then to add to that, the covenants of promise are the means by which Israel will participate in sanctifying and glorifying his name. Now we've already looked at one covenant in the first session this morning. That was the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, look back there with me real quick. Look at Genesis 12. And as I stated in the first session, the issue of the covenants of promise and his name are going to go hand in hand. They're gonna, you're going to start to see them converge. In other words, the covenants of promise are the, the means by which he not only, as I, as I said, are the means by which not only he reveals who he is, but that he's able to have others participate in the manifesting of his name, of his, of his grandeur, of his glory, of his character and essence, and who he is, and, and also what he's doing. And so we're beginning to look at this. The first one, again, we're going to look at, I forgot how many there are, Abrahamic Covenant, the Palestinian Covenant, it was often called the Palestinian Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, and the New Covenant. Those are four covenants of promise. Covenants of promise mean it's what God's going to do for Israel, what he does for them because they can't do it for themselves. And we're also going to put one other covenant in there. That's the law covenant. The, the law contract, the law of Moses, is not a covenant of promise. It's not God doing it for Israel uh, because they can't do it. It's Israel trying to do it for themselves uh, to try to please God in and of themselves. And so we're also going to look at that because it's going to help us to understand the, its counterpart, the new covenant. But look at the Abrahamic covenant here, what is often called the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 12... Look at verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of, my, uh, out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now there's a lot in there that he covenants for in three verses. Essentially, we broke it down. It's the land, even though he, said, he says here he's going to show it to him. You go later on in chapter 12, um, or chapter, yeah, chapter 12 and verse 7. He says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And so he's going to give them this land. So the main thing in view is, is or there's a few main things in view. Uh, the ones that I just mentioned, uh, or that I want to mention, is the land... 
Uh, the land with the great nation concept is the issue of the kingdom. We looked back at Genesis 12, Nimrod and his kingdom and the great city that was involved. That's And, and Abra, Abram coming from that territory, that's what he would have in his mind when God said that to him. And that's what God wants him to understand. Is that kingdom, that great city that you just came from, I'm telling you to come out of, I'm going to make of you that and better. Not just, not just Nimrod. And by the way, a Nimrod wasn't a Nimrod. Nimrod was one of the most intelligent men that ever lived the earth, on this earth. He was able to bridge the gap between heaven and earth, or had the, at least the capability to do that. God, God had to stop him. And that's no small feat. And man still has been trying to do that uh, for, for a long time now. But he was no Nimrod. As we, we, it's, it's just silly how we take biblical concepts and we make it into things like that. But anyways, with that being said, the land... The great nation, which is that kingdom concept. And then we also looked at the issue of, in chapter 13, when he begins to amplify upon this even more, just look at verse 15, Genesis 13, verse 15. He says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, which he's already said. And he says, And to thy seed, what? Forever. And so one of the things that is involved in this covenant is not only the, the giving of the land, but the duration of time in which they're going to have the land is forever. And if you're going to possess that land forever, you need eternal life. And that's one of the things that's covenanted in here. The other thing that we, we moved on from is that God doesn't want to just use Abraham, Abraham and his seed just for any old purpose. Uh, there's a specific purpose in view, but also that also, it also goes hand in hand with why God created man in general in the first place. And that is for him to have an intimate relationship and fellowship with man. God created man for man to be his helpmeet. He, 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 he has that intimacy of, of a relationship and fellowship among the Godhead, the Son and the Spirit. And he wanted to extend that out in connection with the creature that he made, mankind... And, and extend his character in essence, extend all of his attributes and his components, his love, his mercy, his grace, his justice, all these things he wanted to educate man in and, 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 and have uh, his glory and those things be manifest even further in his creation. That's why he's created man. And he created man to help him in that and, 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 and graciously participate in him and what he, wants to get a, what he wants to do in his creation that he's made, which is yet to be seen because of the fall. And so as we go on in these covenants, these covenants of promise and God's providing, one of the things that he wants to get done is not only reconcile the earth, he doesn't want people who don't know him to be involved in reconciling the earth. He doesn't want people who just have eternal life but really don't know him to participate in reconciling the earth. He wants those that not only have that eternal life but also know him. Know him. To participate in what he's doing in connection with why he made the earth. And so as we go through these covenants, we see that education, learning, instructing, teaching, all these things are involved from the get-go with man, and we see resident within these covenants, in these covenants of promise. And what we began to see is this, the old covenant, even though it's not a covenant of promise, there's an education involved in here. Now, get two places with me. Um, get, uh, get Exodus 15. Exodus 15, that's what I want. And then get Romans chapter 2 again. Exodus 15 and Romans 2. And we're going to look at Romans 2 first. This issue of educating his people, it was always, as I stated, it's always been there with, with man. When Adam was on the scene, when Noah's there, after Noah, with Abram, we, uh, um, we're going to, see, we'll, I don't know if we will, event, we, we will eventually, I'm sure, uh, deal with how, he, how Abraham was to know God and what he was doing, he, do, he does some phenomenal things with Abram. My goodness. Uh, he puts him in that deep sleep. And uh, there's the darkness and there's that, that, they call it the bloody lane or the bloody pathway. There's those five, anim, five animals. The th first three were cut in half. The, the, second, the last two weren't. Uh, um, a turtle dove and a, pit, a young pigeon. 
and he does that, and, 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 and God goes through that path. All the education of that, the education of, that, of, of resurrection, one of those things that he's going to give the land forever, that's one of the ways he knew when he offered up his son Isaac that God was, would, be able to have, uh, would be able to raise him from the dead, as the writer of Hebrews says. A whole bunch of things of how he educates Abram and how Abram got it. Abraham got it, a lot of those things. Um, and as you proceed on in history, eventually with the nation of Israel as a whole, this education is, is supposed to go, go deeper and, 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 and farther than just some fundamental things. Um, and that's what we find in the law. In the law, we find some education going on there. Uh, look at Romans 2. We've already went through this in the first session, but just again to get it in our mind. Look at what he says here in verse 17. He says, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approves the things that are more excellent, being what? Instructed. instructed out of the law. And then he comes along and says, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide. In fact, you go look up the word led. Led by the Spirit was the main issue that we're looking at. And what you're going to find is guide. To guide. And what we're seeing here is the counterpart to the led being, being led by the Spirit is the law. And, and what the law did, it guided them. And we'll look at it a little, in a little bit more. But he says, And are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind. The law was their guide, and they were supposed to be guided by it to be able to guide others with them. I was going backwards there. I, well, maybe I wasn't to you. I was going backwards to myself. <laughs> but then he goes on and he says, A light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of what? Knowledge and of the truth and the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou, uh, thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God for the name of there it is. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as is written. Now, you basically have every component of, of the beginning of the teaching and education down to the, the leadership supposed to be being guided by it and, and therefore instructing to the preaching, to the, to, the, um, to the saying. He says, sayest, verse 22. He, he says in verse 21, teachest. He says in verse 20, the form of knowledge same verse, instructing. Verse 19, the guide of the blind. Verse 18, they're instructed out of the law. The law is an education system. It's a way in which God was going to educate his people. Now, there's more context to it than that. And this is why Paul, later on, we looked at this as well, Galatians chapter 3, that the law was a schoolmaster. Chapter 4, it was a tutor and governor. And there's just a whole host of places that is vitally important to grasp. Because logically, if the old was an education system, then the new is what? An education system. Better than the old. It can do things the old can't. And that's, that's, that's what we're looking at in Romans chapter 8. We're looking at, we're not under law, but we're under grace. And then he comes along and he says later on in chapter 8, don't walk, at, don't walk after the flesh, walk after the spirit. You know, mind the things of the spirit. Well, if you've got to mind the things of the spirit, he's got to teach you them in the first place in order for you to mind them. And he says, don't live after the, the flesh, live after the spirit. Through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body. Through what the spirit taught you, that's how you mortify the deeds of the body. And then he's going to come along and says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again the fear. That law, but you've received the spirit of adoption. That very spirit that's leading us is a spirit of adoption. And he educates us. And if, and if we grasp the issue of adoption as well, we're going to, this issue of education is going to be there as well. And we'll eventually do that. So I want you to see that at the outset before we get into now looking at the law, even though it's not a covenant of promise. Now come back with me to Exodus 15. When God, through Moses, brought Israel out of Egypt, 
through the Red Sea and before they got to Mount Sinai. So if, maybe I have it on my... I don't have it. I don't want that either. I mean, I want my son, but... <laughs> not, I don't want it. When you're up here, you can get tongue twisted quite a bit. So. So what I want you to see right now, what we're going to look at, and we've, we've talked about this before, when, uh, we'll just say this is the, the Red Sea here, when Israel crosses that Red Sea, before they get to Mount Sinai here, where they get the law, God doesn't bring them right there. He, he takes them, if I can illustrate it this way, he, he, he takes a, a, a different route, and he does that to, to we're going to see, prove them. Another word that you can use when you're talking about an education. All right? Before they get to Mount Sinai, before they get that law, he's educating them in something. And God's been doing this since, they've, since they were in Egypt. He's been educating them about his name. We saw that with Moses there. Before he goes back into Egypt, he says, who shall I say sent me? He says, I am that I am. And then he says, I am blank. His name, that, that timelessness issue, the certainty of his counsel, that, that unlimited capacity to do for them what they can't do for themselves. And then he manifests that in Egypt when he brings them out under the most uh, cruel and, aff and afflicted circumstances that they find themselves in. And then, they, and then they get to that Red Sea there, which is my river here. And they're stuck. They got Egypt on their back and they got the Red Sea in front of them and God brings them through that. And then, and then he's going to educate them even more before they get them outside. He's educating them about who they are and who he is. And I want you to see that here in Exodus 15. Look at Exodus 15. We've seen this already before, but look at verse 23. It says, And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. It brings them there. This isn't just, oops, Moses led them the wrong way. God puts them right in this situation to educate them. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and, showed him, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he, what? Proved, Proved them. Educating them. Proved them. And said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all the statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord. And here you have a, a, a they call them the Jehovah compound names. That, that issue of I am blank, Jehovah Rafeka, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Raha. Jehovah Jireh. And you have all those, those seven Jehovah compound names. And here, I, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. You need healing. Here you are, some waters. You can't drink of it. I can give that to you. He's educating them. He's using this real situation and circumstance that he's put them in to educate them about who he is. Because I'll tell you what, if you don't know this about yourself, and you don't know something about yourself, by nature, we don't want to know God. We don't want to know who we are, and we don't know. Want to, we'll kick against it. We'll kick and kick and kick. It's until we're confronted with the Word of God, and we allow it. We let it work in us. That's when that change is going to take place. And we want to look at everything else outwardly to affect what's going on inwardly. But we got to let the Word of God affect us inwardly. And the same problem with them. That's what he's manifesting. He's using the nation of Israel to manifest what's in man in general. And that's what, he, that's what he's doing. Look at chapter 16. Look at chapter 16 and verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven. They're, they're murmuring, complaining. They don't have food now. Before it was water, now it's food. And so the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them. What is he going to prove them in? Whether they will walk in my law or no. Now, you're right, we're right here. The law is coming. 
He's proving them right now whether they walk in this or not. They fail miserably. They don't take the certain rate. They take more than they're supposed to. Proves them. By that, they're supposed to learn, are they going to walk in that law or not? No. They're not going to walk in that law very good. And that's what he does. There's five main instances in this time period that he uses to prove them, to educate them before he ever brings them to that law. And by then, they're supposed to learn we're not going to be able to walk in your law. Instead, this is their response. Look at Exodus 19. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Now they're, now they're there, Mount Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mount, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Remember what I said in the first session about the means doesn't justify the end? They're looking at the end here. They're, looking at, they're not looking at the means, and they're not looking at the means, that covenant, in light of what they were supposed just to have learned. They were supposed to just have learned from all these things that he's told them, I'm, I'm doing this to prove you whether you keep my law or not. This wasn't a secret thing. This wasn't a secret thing between him and Moses. I'm doing this to see what the... Oh, they're, they were to know this. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. To prove you, to educate you. That, that you need me. I'm the creator. You're the created. And, and, and if, if, if you want to get... If, if the, you want to get the Abrahamic uh, covenant accomplished and get into the land and be there forever, I'm going to be the one doing it. And... They look at the end. They look at the a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, verse 5. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. For these are the words which thou uh, shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And before he even gives his covenant, he gives the manner in which he's going to, how it's going to operate. If you then this, not like the Abrahamic, that covenant of promise, I will give to you, and that you'll be this. And you'll be this. This one's if you, then you'll be that. Folks, he's already promised those three things. Essentially, they're back there in the Abrahamic covenant. He's already told them he's going to give it to them. And by all the education he's given them, and they still, look what they say, verse 7. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. They shouldn't have said that. You can, you can talk about however they should have not said. They did not learn. If you've ever had children, you know exactly what's going on right there. And if you don't, you were the child that was in a situation like that as, as well. We've all been there. We've, we've, we've spoken because we don't understand something, we haven't learned something, and, and because we're looking at the end, and, and we, don't quite grasp, we don't quite grasp everything, whether it's will for, will for ignorance or just ignorance in general. And they should not have said that based upon what they learned, based upon their experiences. The only, why, the only reason why they are where they are right now is because of God, Him getting them there. And they say, well, we'll take over from here. God says, okay, you take over from here, and then you can be this. Then you'll be this to me. I say, okay, we'll do it. Not only that, but he gives them opportunity to back out. You go through the account, and he, and he doesn't bring it upon them right away. The way in which he presents the information, he doesn't just bring it upon them right away. He gives them some time to back out of it, and they don't back out. And as soon as they're into that thing, they're bound by it. And they're bound by some things we're going to look at in Leviticus 26 that make up the rest of their history. 
of, of, of failure to comply, to, uh, com failure to con con uh, uh, conform and to perform it, and therefore they get the consequence. They don't get what he just says there. They get something that he doesn't say right there. The flip side of the blessing, they get all the curses. And so what I want you to see is that he's been educating them before that. Now think about this. If he's been educating them about, the, about who he is and who they are before this, and when he gets to this point, he's proving them whether they'll keep his law or not, what would you think is built into that law? Education. Education. And education about what they're supposed to learn here. If they didn't learn what they're supposed to learn all through here, it's going to be in there. There's other things in there too, but that also is in there. And that's why, folks, that's why Paul says what he says and connects with all these things. And, and, and when he says, and scripture has concluded all under sin, and, 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 and the, 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 the law was given that the whole world may be guilty, that's what's going on here. They were supposed to learn they were guilty. They were supposed to learn that they were sinners by nature. They were supposed to learn that God, they need God. If they're going to be in this land that God's promised them forever, you've got to give us eternal life because we're going to die. And through that one trial without water and they're complaining and murmuring about it, they definitely don't got eternal life. Without having bread, they definitely don't have eternal life. He provides, I'm life, I'm your nourishment, I'm for your good. And they come along and say, well, we'll, we'll do it. I got it, no problem. And so this is what they end up getting. Look at Leviticus 26. Now this is important because when you understand the context of when the law was given, it's going to help drastically understand the new covenant. Which we might not get to today, so jot these things down, look at them. We'll review them next week. Or dock them in the back of your head, whatever you're able to do. You go to these restaurants now, and it almost seems like it's uh, uh, required that you have to memorize what a person orders. I don't know how they can do that. Uh, oftentimes they get it wrong, but you should have wrote it down. <laughs> write it down if you need to. But look at Leviticus 26. Essentially from verses, uh, verse 1 through 13, you have the blessing of the law. So if they hearken to his voice, they'll get all the blessings. But if they don't, this is what they end up getting. Look at verse 14. But if you will not... Hearken unto me. Does that sound familiar from Exodus 19? He's bringing that up now. And he's giving this to the Levites. The leadership. This is what they're, the leadership is supposed to know and what they're supposed to extend down there to, uh, therefore, for, uh, for the people. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, that, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning agu that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. This is what Israel wanted, based upon their performance. This is what they wanted. This is what they didn't learn from is, okay, if, if I do, I get, the, I get the blessing. I get to be the peculiar tre the treasure of the holy people, the kingdom of priests. But if I don't, this is what they get. Now, the way that this is ordered, if I can, I'll just leave it from right there. The way that this is set forth is when he starts giving the blessings and curses of this law contract right here, what he ends up doing with those curses, he's anticipating either their, their, compli their compliance or their non-compliance. Them hearkening or not hearkening. And as he deals with the issue of their curses and the not hearkening, what he's doing is he's, he, he's, he's outlining Israel's history in advance. And what you have are, what I've come to learn and I, I've adopted and I call it as well, is these Five courses of punishment. Now, where do, you, where do you get the five from? We'll look at, we just read verses 14 through 17. Now, look at verse 18. 
He says, And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven, you seven times more for your sins. So what you have is that similar statement. After he gives the first set of courses, he gives that statement. After the second set of curses, he gives that statement again. After the third set, he gives that statement again. After the fourth, he gives that statement again, and you don't see it again. That's why you get, that's why you get five. Now, you might be wondering, well, how do you know this is Israel's history in advance? Why don't they just get this all at the same time? Because when you go through the history, you start to see these things play out. You start to see they're, they're, they're sowing their seed in vain because their enemies are going to take of it. You go through the book of Judges and Ruth and the first part of 1 Samuel, essentially Judges through 1 Samuel at the end of 15 there, and that's what's taking place. That's such a hard time with the Philistines, remember? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and those are the, the nations around Israel's border, and Israel sowing their seed, but they're doing it in vain because their enemies on the border are coming in and taking of it. There's a little border aids. That's just the first. Then he goes on and says the second. So after he says seven times more for your sins, verse 19, I will break the pride of your what? Wow. Right here with at the end of Solomon's reign, by the way, in between here, I'll do another little mountain here. You have David and Solomon, which is going to be a very important part. God has every legal right to bring the second set of curses upon him, but he doesn't. In fact, God had every right not to give him judges, but he does. The judge, if you read Judges chapter 1, what ends up taking place, Israel just going down, down, down. God would raise up a judge, and things would go well for a period of time. Once the judge dies, things got worse than they were before. God raises up a judge. They die. Things get even worse than the two previous times. That was God's gracious provision to give judges. That's the grace in the Old Testament to do that. Well, after the first course of punishment, he, he gives Israel a time of the, the, the golden rule of, of Israel, golden age of Israel with David and Solomon. And we're going to talk about that as we get to the Davidic covenant. It has great significance to it. After Solomon dies, he brings the nation back in apostasy, but because of his father David, the second course doesn't come upon the nation. But when Solomon dies, it, that's what ends up taking place. And after Solomon dies, guess what's happened to the nation? Their government, the break, he breaks their pride and power. You have the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. But not only that, he goes on and he says, And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. There was a unique prophet at this time, Elijah. And one of his miracles was the issue of holding back the rain. He didn't do that just, oh, I'm a prophet of God, I think I'm going to hold back the rain for three years. He does that right in line with that law contract and right where he is. Then the next one, look what it says in the next, next verse. He says, And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. By the way, once this one starts, he, he, he stops it with this, this, this unique time period he gives them there. But he starts it again when this one starts, and the second one is added to it. And then when the third one comes in, he doesn't stop the one and then start it. It's all added to this is why when you get out to the end after the cross and then you get out to the, tribu- the tribulation period why he calls it the, the cup of his wrath and indignation without mixture because it's just building up. Building up. Building, building, building up. So what he, when he says there in verse 20 the land shall not yield her increase well they already have their enemies doing those border raids now the rain is going to be held back from them, so the little bit that they get is going to be taken as well. And then you have another statement like that, again in verse 21. And if ye walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. So notice how he says seven times more. That's in addition to what was, what was previous. And then he says, verse 22, I will also send wild beasts among you which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. Highways is where you trade. Well, now they, they have their enemies. They're sowing their seed in vain because their enemies are coming in. They're not getting any rain 
at least for that, that three years. Elijah goes off the scene. Elisha comes on the scene. His very first thing that he does is prophets from, false prophets from Bethel come. He curses them, and she bears. Wild beasts come out and devour those children. They destroy them. Third course of punishment. And their highways are going to be desolate. They're not even going to be able to trade as well as, as, as well as they could. So now things are getting really bad. I mean, they were bad before, but... And then he goes on in verse 23. He gives another statement similar to that of verse 21 and verse 18. He says, and if you will not be reformed, that's his whole purpose. Not his whole purpose, but one of the purposes in that law. Here, they should have been reformed. Here, they should have been proved and educated about who they are. But he puts that in the law, and these curses are going to reform them. They're going to begin to be educated with all the hardship that they're going through of who they are. They're not getting the blessing. They're not, getting the, they're not a peculiar treasure. They're supposed to be the head of nations, and they're going to become the tail. They're not a kingdom of priests. Their kingdom is broken. And he's educating them over and over again. You can't be what I call you to be unless I be it for you, unless I provide it for you. And over and over and over again, look at what he says here during this time, what's going to take place. In verse 25, it says, I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. And ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And look how bad it gets. Verse 26, And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. And they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. And ye shall eat and not be satisfied. I don't know about you, but any time, I've, I've barely ever been in a kitchen with ten women cooking. But I know if I did, I've been in a, in a kitchen with maybe three or four women cooking, and I tell you what, what comes out of that is a plentiful amount of food. Tons of food. Here, ten women bake their bread, not, and usually there's one or two ovens or a crock pot or something. Going, they bake their bread in one oven. And what comes out is not, oh, a whole bunch of food we got. No, they got to distribute it by weight. You get this a little bit, you get this a little bit, you get this a little bit. Things get real bad. But it's not done yet. That's, that's this time. That's leading up to this final, final course. Now look what he says again. Verse 27. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. Folks, you, 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 if you're following along, you can't come along and say, man, God is just not just. Israel wanted this. They wanted it. God didn't want them to have it. They wanted it. This is their fault. I'm sorry, I get fired up about it because I can't stand when Bible mockers and scoffers come along and say, man, look at what God's going to do to his own people. They wanted this, not him. He's going to provide them to get out from under it when they finally are reformed, when they learn what they were supposed to learn. They need to learn it, because if they're going to participate, they need to have a mind like his. And his was not one of pride. It's selfless. It's thinking of others. And they're high-minded. They think we can do this. It's all, in, it's all in us. We have it too. He's just using Israel as, as, as the in sample to the world. Now, that takes place during the fifth course of punishment. The Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Assyrians come upon the north, the Babylonians upon, where's my southern, here you go, the south there. Babylon, when, he, when the king Nebuchadnezzar comes, he, is, he, he besieges the city. The main tactic of war at that time was you simply, you got, you got the bigger army, you just camp out around the whole city. Starve them out. They can't come in, they can't go out. Not only that, if they did go out, their highways are desolate. They don't have much anyways. And so what they end up doing is they start participating in cannibalism because that's all they have left. And you read that through Israel's, Israel's history, and, and you, it goes on and describes what he's going to do. Now, the reason why I bring this up to you is because two things. One, I want you to see that when we deal with David, this time period is not in there. <coughs> is not in the Israel's history in advance. 
And when David comes on the scene, it's not because Israel hearkened to God's voice. God did it by his grace. And there's a reason for that, which we're going to talk about. The main reason is that Davidic covenant. And that Davidic covenant is in light of them going through this first course of punishment. He doesn't do it after the second, third, fourth. He does it right here. And there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that more as we go on. And the second thing I want you to see is that this is all an education. And it's education throughout all their history. Because they, they got to learn that lesson the hard way. We get to just look at all of it. Or just listen to it from Paul. Like what he says. Uh, that, that, that the law is given... Um, that, 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 oh, look at it. Look at over there in Romans chapter 3. Paul can come along and just sum this all up. Israel had to go through it. Look at Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 19. Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 19. Next week I'll provide the. We might have some of the timelines in the back, but try, when you go through Israel's history, I get the, essentially the book, chapter, and verse of, of these time periods as you go through them. Uh, when, you, when you're dealing with Isaiah through Malachi, you're, you're dealing with right here, and, and, and they're, they're prophesying about the fifth course of punishment coming, and then what's going to transpire all throughout that fifth course, even the Lord's cross work, because it's in the fifth course of punishment. And, and, and Daniel's time schedule, when he gives the 490 years before the kingdom comes. And it didn't come because of the dispensation of grace. Everything was on schedule. That's why when the Lord comes, I hope this is, I'm, I'm just trying to overwhelm you, I'll be honest. Just, 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 no, I, I hear these things, I'm like, wow, I just want to look at, I wanna, what is that? What do you say? I want to look at, I want to hear that. That's why when, the Lord, when, 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 when uh, the Lord starts preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he says it's at hand. The time is fulfilled. Well, what time? Daniel 9. That time, 490 years, 483 years, I'm sorry, 480 years had transpired when he started his earthly ministry. There's 10 years left to go, essentially, in regards to that time schedule. His three-year earthly ministry, about three and a half, four. And then you had a, a, a Luke 13, he gives a one-year time period of uh, extension of mercy and forbearance. And then essentially you had the Lord's Day of Wrath come on the scene. That's why he's saying it's at hand. The time is fulfilled, Daniel 9. Because there was, they knew, they were supposed to know that from Daniel going forth, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that, that 490 years is going to pass, then God would establish his kingdom. They're supposed to know. Again, another thing Israel failed to know. And so what I want you to see is that in all this, there's, there's, there's education. I brought that up for another reason, but, oh yeah, we're in Romans 3. Look at Romans 3. In verse 19, he says, and we know how Paul says what they learned the hard way, we can just, Paul can sum it up, and hopefully we can just, just take Paul at his word, God at his word. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them, Israel, who are under the law. They were the ones under the law, specifically. But now think about this. If way back here with Abram, which is not our chart, you have this other line of people, the uncircumcision, they were the circumcision, that's what we have on our chart here. If they were under the law, and they're right here, well, in some degree, form, or manner, those uncircumcision, those Gentiles are under the law as well. That's exactly what Paul says right here. He says, we know that, what, say it to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. And then you could think, well, every mouth of Israel. But he says, and all the world may become guilty before God. This is what he's trying to do here. Prove them, educate them about who they are by nature. And, and that they're guilty before God. One of the things we saw back there in Exodus when he proclaimed his name, even though he doesn't clear the guilty, but he visits the transgressions upon the third and fourth. That was part of his graciousness. To extend the punishment that was supposed to take place at a certain generation, he, ex he would extend it to the third and then the fourth generation. And he's just, but yet he's long-suffering. 
so that they can learn what they're supposed to learn. Now, we just have a little time left, so I'm going to begin to introduce the next. Well, we've got to look at one more thing before we deal with the Davidic covenant. Now, I know this is a lot. I'm, I'm ever aware of that. And I'll review next time, and hopefully through repetition, it'll, it'll start to sink down. But this is what's in the law covenant, and we looked at things preceding the law covenant to help you to understand what would be in the law covenant, and that there's an education in it. Now, what we also looked at before that is there's education not only of who Israel was, but also of who God is. All right? Now, how, obviously, when we, when we learn about Leviticus 26 and these courses of punishment, the primary way that Israel is going to be taught now is through their chastisement, through their curses, through the afflictions that they face. And God uses that to educate them about who he is. Now, if you have read through Judges uh, and Ruth, there's, there's a lot of things that God educates Israel in. But there's five major things. Ruth, I don't know if I can fit this in here. Who knows what Ruth is all about? The book of Ruth. Redemption, exactly. And after the end of the book of Ruth, you're dealing with David's seed, by the way. It's preparing you for David to come on the scene. But before, does Ruth come first and then Judges? No, J Joshua judges Ruth. But in Judges, you also have some, if you go through, there's a lot of Judges that God raises up, but there's, there's ones that, there's specifically two, that there's more space that God gives to them. And those two are Gideon and who else? Samson. Samson. Gideon and Samson. And there's two main themes, with, or one theme for each individual. They're, 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 these are mixed as well, but a, a main theme. Gideon, deliverer. Samson, avenger. Wow, you guys are... I know I taught this before, but it's good to hear it, hear it repeated. Um, if you, if you want to know more about this, we went through this in our Bible survey as well on Thursday nights. And so you can go back and find these things and where we, I actually went back to Judges and we, and we dealt with it. Right now I'm just giving it to you. And then there's two other things taking place. During, when you get to Samuel, 1 Samuel, Israel begins to want a king. Saul, King Saul. And that was a really bad choice because God says God was their king. And so what they need is they need a king as well. They need redemption. They need a deliverer. They need a avenger. They need a king. And the last thing is they're under the first course of punishment. You go read Ruth. And the reason why they're out of Israel is because there's a famine. And there's a famine from their enemies coming in and taking of their goods, just like Leviticus 26 set forth. Um, but what they, and, and so they're under those curses of punishment there, of that first course, Leviticus 26. And so what they need, they're under, they're under the curses. What they need is the blessing. Now, the reason why that's significant. Now, there's, there's many other things that are in that section of Scripture. So I'm not going to uh, debate you on that. I'm just saying these are, these are five major things. Okay? Now, when you're re reading Leviticus 26... God says, if you don't hearken to my voice, I'm going to punish you seven times more for your sins. He doesn't bring that upon them right away. It's a phenomenal thing. Instead, you have this time period with David and Solomon. And with David and Solomon, they have great blessing. Their kingdom rises. They have victory over the enemies. Uh, uh, David is the man of, uh, man of war. Solomon is the man of peace, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ during his day of wrath and then in his kingdom. Uh, you, 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 have, you have great health, wealth, and prosperity 
going throughout the whole entire nation and kingdom. It's what the apostles, during Acts chapter 1, when they're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, they say, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? They're referring to back with their father David and Solomon. And God provides that to them by his grace. And the main reason he does it, now there's other reasons, but the main reasons he does it is to give them the Davidic covenant. And there's five main things in that Davidic covenant in that are right after what he taught them in the first course of punishment of what he can provide them by his name. I'll be your redeemer, your deliverer, your avenger, your king, and bless everything you need me to be, I'll be for you. And we're going to begin to examine that. And it's a phenomenal thing. And what's even more phenomenal is that he, he, he begins to teach it to, to Nathan, who Nathan gives it to David in 2 Samuel 7. But that's, only a, that's just the general gist of the Davidic covenant. The main content of that Davidic covenant is what we have in our Psalms. 150 of them. And guess how many books the book of Psalms is broken down into? Five. Five of them. And when you're dealing with, I don't have it off the top of my head, Psalms 1 through 41, I think. 42. You're dealing with redemption. You have those key core psalms in there. Psalm 22, 23, and 24. In connection with his cross. That redemption. And we'll go through these as we, as we go on next week. And so on and so on. When you get out to the last psalms there. Blessed be God. Blessed, blessed this. Bless this. Bless this. You're like, man, can't the psalmist stop saying blessed? Blessed this. You're like, we're just repeating it. Blessed is the king of the most high. The rules over all the earth. Blessed this. It's all about prophetically that kingdom, the final aspect of that Davidic covenant, and they're gonna, he's going to fulfill them in this order. When he comes, and, and one of the things he puts in that Davidic covenant is, I'm going to be, to your seed, David, I'm going to be a father, and he's going to be my son. And hopefully it starts clicking with Romans 8, verse 14. For they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And now there's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We get to be sons of God. Now, not in connection with Israel's program. We'll see that as we go on. But nevertheless, that privilege is still ours. And each one of those sections of the Psalms deals with these issues. And he fulfills them in that order. That's why he didn't pour out his wrath before the cross work. Rather, it's the cross work first, that redemption. He's only fulfilled one. It was the most important one. Because if he doesn't do that one, he can't do the rest. And so what, he, he, he does the first one, that redemption, and then he's able to do his deliverance, his avengement, be that king, and the blessing. And so we'll, as I said, we'll look through that as we go on. And what we're going to find in that is not only a repetition of the Abrahamic covenant, but we're going to see some unique things in connection with how God is going to perform that Davidic covenant. How he's going to get the Abrahamic covenant fulfilled is through his son. And remember, I don't have it up here now, but one of the things I said is that those covenants of promise are the means by which not only God's going to sanctify and glorify his name, but they're also the means by which Israel, God is going to use Israel to glorify and sanctify his name. And those things, if you can understand some of those things, we're going to have a greater ability to handle this issue of being led by the Spirit. As I said before, there, there are things that are similar throughout both programs, and there's things that are different. The fundamental issues of justification and sanctification in that new covenant we, we receive, we're not under the new covenant as if it was given to us. But rather, those new covenant spiritual things, God, it's like he, he's got the provision of it, and he just takes it, and he gives them to us. And although we're not a part of the kingdom of heaven on earth, we are a part of the kingdom of God, Paul says. And the aspect of the kingdom that we participate in is going to be in the heavenly places. 
And just as there's a throne and positions to rule on this earth, so is there a throne and positions to rule up in the heavenly places that are first and foremost his as the seed of David, but also that he provides through a teaching ministry of the Spirit for us to participate with him. Not just get there, but participate with him. That's why he's created man. Remember? To participate with him. Not just sit on the, 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 the sidelines, but to be actively engaged with what he's doing. And it's all provided by God's grace. So we have a lot to get into still, and this Davidic covenant is an essential one to look at. So for next time, read all the Psalms. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Read 2 Samuel 7. That wasn't funny. I thought that was, come on. You guys are a tough crowd this morning. I don't know what it is, but maybe you've never seen the Psalms. They're, you know, I was kidding. Anyways, I will encourage you to read 2 Samuel 7, uh, specifically verses 11 through 16. Uh, read Isaiah chapter 9. You can read Daniel chapter 7 uh, to get a little bit familiar with this Davidic covenant. Out of the Davidic covenant becomes the, it comes out the issue of the Christ. So therefore, anytime you see the word Christ, there's an element to the Davidic covenant. That's why Paul says he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's why Paul in his last epistle says, remember that Jesus Christ uh, of the seed of David according to my gospel. Part of God, uh, Paul's gospel involves Jesus Christ who is the seed of David. And there's other things as well that, that we can learn from and are very beneficial. They're not completely, all, every, not everything is completely true as they are set forth in Israel's program, but there's a lot of parallel concepts, more than usually meets the eye. Give you one. What do, what do we call the, this, usually this information given to Paul, and that he calls it in Ephesians? What do we call it? The what of Christ? The what? The dispensation, yeah, but what else? The mystery of who? The mystery of Christ. Well, if you can think about the Christ in connection with Israel's program, there is no mystery, but if you can think about that, now just think about it in connection with the mystery of Christ. Now, they couldn't think of it that way, but when you think about the mystery of Christ, there's some great parallels that you can get in Ephesians starts to open up to you and how he's going to be able to gather all together in one in Christ. It's phenomenal. But if you don't have that foundation, like Paul has, how he starts out the book of Romans, not, I mean, you're going to get a lot of understanding, don't get me wrong. But there are some things that, that won't click the way they're supposed to click, um, just like any education goes. So again, I know we have a lot ahead. I know I gave you a lot, but we'll, we'll just keep plugging away. And uh, hopefully it, it comes to, to settle a little bit, that we see the parallels, we see the similarities, uh, and that we keep the differences separate uh, of the programs. Uh, but ultimately, as Paul says, that we can take this all scripture and, and it can become profitable to us and learn from the things of, of old in Israel's program, but be able to see these things in connection with our program and, and the, the mystery aspect of these things. It's a phenomenal thing. Well, I said uh, 2 Samuel 7, verses 11 through 16. Uh, you can read Isaiah 9, verse 6 and following. Daniel 7, essentially as, as a whole, especially the, the middle portion there. Um, you can read Romans 1. You can read 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 3, the mystery of Christ. Read Ephesians. When he, when he starts talking about time past, but now, and ages to come there, he's not saying that to just rightly divide the word of truth. He's already done that in Romans 9, 10, 11. What he's doing there when he ends Ephesians 2, and he, he, he talks about Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's Israel. That's in Israel information. But then he starts talking about the whole building of God. The building isn't just down here. There's building up there as well. And then we get to be part of it. But our, well, our aspect is up there. So we'll, like I said, we'll, 
we'll plug it in and, 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 and deal with this more. But let's pray to conclude. Father, we thank you for this time to look at your word. And Father, not that we haven't gotten to some exciting information prior to this, but um, this is exciting exciting stuff. Not only learn about what you're doing in time past, but see the significance of it, of what's, what's, what we are doing now. And although the parallels, again, need to be rightly, uh, the, the parallels and similarities are there, there's also differences that need to be rightly divided. We can, we can learn much, just like Paul says. How many times do we see in Paul's epistles when he brings up the concepts of these covenants? How many times does he go back to the scriptures of old? Not to set forth that we're a part of that, but to bring up parallel issues to what's going on today. And so, Father, we thank you that you provided us the whole can of scripture. And I pray that we would be ones that it could be said of us, as it was of David, that we were, that we were men and women after your own heart, that we want to know you, that we just can't get enough. And if we enlarge ourselves to who you are and how you reveal yourself in your word, specifically through the Apostle Paul and what, he, what you gave him in connection with the purpose we have. Father, I pray that these things would impact the saints. That these things would prick their hearts for good. That these things would read them just as much as they read it, if not more. And that it would constrain them as they see Christ in it all, that they would constrain them to want to live unto you, and not in their own way, but in the way in which you have provided for and the way in which you have set forth. We thank you for the grand privilege of gathering together and opening up this most precious book. We thank you for this time that we can redeem to your honor and glory, and I thank you again for these saints, their faithfulness, their commitment to learning these things, to getting up on a Sunday morning when it is contrary to our culture and our society, because they value you. And may that value and that esteeming of you just ever increase. May they abound in, in that. And therefore, may their study, uh, may their knowledge, may their understanding abound, and may their love towards others abound as, a fruit, as, as fruit of all that. And Father, that will just all be preparatory for what we get into as we progress on here in the book of Romans. So I thank you for them, and I thank you for this time. I do pray if someone's here listening, that they have not trusted Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, how that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. May they believe that good news this very moment, because that cross works has the provision for them for, to, to save them from the debt and penalty of their sins. The way in which they receive that provision of salvation is not by any works of their own, but by faith and faith alone. And the moment they, you see their faith trusting Christ, you'll justify them unto eternal life, forgiving all their sins, past, present, and future, and imputing your righteousness unto them, and they will therefore possess the gift of eternal life. May they believe this very moment. And as always, Father, we thank you for this time of grace giving. We don't give grudgingly on necessity. We give in connection and in response to your grace and your word working effectually in our mind and hearts. It's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen.